I'm here today with the Reverend Dr. Mark Laberton, President and Professor of Preaching at Fuller Theological Seminary. In addition to publishing articles in such periodicals as Christianity Today and Radix, Mark has authored the books The Dangerous Act of Loving Your Neighbor and The Dangerous Act of Worship. Yet the work he considers most significant is his newest book called The Crisis and Promise of Following Jesus Today. In it, he addresses profoundly and directly what it means in a broken and hurting world to practice our shared Christian vocation of following Jesus. Thank you, Mark, for joining us today. Happy to do this. It's great. Thank you. As you know, Frederick Beekner will soon be turning 90 years old. Is there anything you would like to wish him for this great milestone? I would certainly be happy to wish uh, Frederick Beekner a, a wonderful birthday and a celebration of a life that has had many seasons and chapters and experiences, but I just hope it's a day of imagination and joy and hope. Thank you very much, Mark. I'm sure Mr. Beekner will greatly appreciate hearing from you. Next, can you tell me how you first learned about his writing? I was first introduced to his writing through a friend that I would say, in the words of Friedrich Schleiermacher, was a cultured despiser of the church, a person who wouldn't be a person that would associate particularly with the church and wouldn't find most Christian writing uh, to be particularly an, an attractive thing to him. But he found uh, his encounter with telling the truth, the gospels, comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale to be quite exciting and interesting and drew him in in a way that caused him to eagerly want to give me this book. So it was the first book of Frederick Beekner's that I owned and a book that I devoured then and have since probably read 20 more times uh, and feel uh, just very, very grateful for and inspired and encouraged and challenged by that book. I think the thing that I'm most grateful for about his writing is that he is a person who has such a vivid theological imagination, that it is an imagination that's grounded in lived experience, but it's also an imagination that sees and hears biblical teaching categories, ideas in ways that extend and, en and enlarge our hearts and our minds and our souls. And I think it's that combination that again and again uh, enlarges us. My dad was a skeptic of the church and of Christian faith. His sense was that what Christian faith does is that it takes great things and makes them small. And what I think is the antidote to that is the character of the kingdom of God, which is the thing that actually is meant to enlarge our heart and our mind. And I think what Frederick Buechner's writing does again and again is to do something very similar to that. It's, it's like uh, a kind of catalytic use of words, images, ideas, relationships, truth-telling, candor that recasts a narrative that sets it free from the bondage of its uh, traditionalisms in certain ways and uh, enlarges our capacity to be able to hear and embrace and understand and engage uh, with God and with the reality of what it means to be fully human. Those are pretty amazing gifts to give, so it's no wonder that his writing has had uh, so much attention. How would you How say that his writing, writing has influenced your own career? I think his writing has influenced me because it's this intersection of the Bible, tradition, the experience of being human, the compassion of being present as pastor and friend, and the intersection of all of that through language. He's a master, of course, in speech and in language, and his ability to take experiences of life and faith and uh, pain and suffering, as well as of hope and celebration and joy, and embody it in language, has been uh, a very powerful thing to me. Many people who use religious language use it in important ways, but I, I find that it's often, uh, especially when it's done in an artistic or literary sense, it's often done with a kind of a spirit that doesn't have enough grit or reality. It may be lovely, but it feels ineffectual. The thing that makes his use of language so powerful to me is that it, it doesn't land in that zone of preciousness, it lands in a zone of lived experience in real time and place 
where words and life intersect. And I think his impact on my ministry and work has really been wanting to imitate that sort of intersection. Wow, that's very impressive insight. Uh, thank you very much for that. You mentioned uh, telling the truth. What other of Mr. Beekner's books have meant the most to you? Um, I have to say, even though I've read a lot of his books, uh, it is the book that I keep returning to most. And I, I find that interesting uh, because while I love the rest of his writing, and I think I've read almost everything that he's written, the reason that I keep coming back to that one in such a singular way is that there are ways, I think, in most writers that there are ideas that are seminal. And I think that book contains, in certain ways, the seminal core of what his other books also go on to express. But when I read them, I, I am conscious that I'm reading them in light of telling the truth because it feels to me like uh, his ideas, the passion, the core of, of so much of what he's written really has emerged and been given first in that book and then been played out across the canvas of all of the other books that, that he's written. But that is the one that has singularly influenced me. Has any of uh, Mr. Beekner's work inspired of anything that you specifically written? I don't know that it's been a direct inspiration, except that I can certainly say that as a preacher and as a writer, when I've gotten stuck and feel some degree of, whether it's writer's block or simply frozen imagination, I, I do have uh, his, some of his books nearby, and I do find reading his words to be very... Uh, dislodging in a really positive sense and so I often have found that by reading his works that the impact has been that it's set me free to do that work in my own terms so I think it's been a derivative of his own sense of liberty insight wisdom creativity and again endlessly imagination that uh, that I've just appreciated so much I think often the Christian faith, especially those that stand in the side of the Christian faith that are particularly concerned about issues of Christian orthodoxy, become paralyzed and uh, become paralyzed really in a, in a small box of images, words, phrases, doctrine. And I think what he has given to many across the Christian world has been this sense that, that if orthodoxy is orthodoxy, then it actually should land in full, vivid human reality. And it's the intersection between the, in a way, I suppose you could say the dogmatic claims and the lived experience of faith and of life that he has continued to explore and, and explode. So I think his impact has been that he's invited people into a deeper humanity. He's invited people into a greater kind of honesty. He's invited people into a deeper reflection on the surprising character of grace and the ability of grace to meet us in comedy, tragedy, and fairy tale in ways that are, um, that are often the source of great liberty, freedom, hope, struggle, candor, communion. Uh, these are all things that I think are part of the overflow of his work in ministry.